Okay, folks, we're going to continue on with our discussion of Charlotte Temple. First, I'll do a little bit of a recap, and then we'll get into some of the themes uh, and some of the more serious things. We had a little fun with it in class. That's cool. Uh, but we also want to get into some of the more serious aspects of the novel. So just to recap a little bit of the uh, uh, historical background, the popularity of the novel in the early Republic, like we said, it's one of the, it was the top-selling novel the first, oh gosh, 50, 40, 50 years of the country's existence. Um, and a few things that influenced its development. You know, in Puritan America, fiction was rather frowned on, so it was drama. Uh, too much poetry writing was frowned on, especially if it was secular subject matter. So when the early novels come out in American history, in American literature, um, they tend to be, you know, true story novels, right? It's because they want to escape the... the um, uh, the accusation that they're all a bunch of lies and made up junk and fantasy and fairy tale. The other thing is that they tried to teach lessons. Okay. So they were moral. They were valuable. Jefferson, Thomas Jefferson thought novels were all trash. Um, so even he was not a Puritan, but even he thought they were junk, uh, junk literature. Um, they're a reflection of the sort of the multi-ethnic society that we were developing into, uh, early American colonial times, uh, was still multi-ethnic. Yes but not nearly so much as it is today. And uh, as you see the uh, novel developing, you also see the country developing culturally. Uh, the economic limitations, we talked about the fact that on the frontier, you couldn't really get a novel uh, very easily. That's okay, you didn't read. And even if you did read and you could get a novel, you didn't have any cash to pay for it with because you didn't have a, anything much more than a barter economy. Um, so there were a lack of publishing outlets. You had to get your, bu your books published over in... In, uh, in England or in Boston to some extent, but uh, there were a lot of different things like declining literacy rates and class conflicts during Jack the Jacksonian era. All that is to say that, you know, uh, right after the revolution, fiction enjoyed a real spurt in growth, and then it kind of collapsed, unfortunately. The first novel most people point to is William Hill Brown's Power of Sympathy. It's kind of the first American novel. This was not very, very long. Um, oh, this was of that time, I should say. Um, and, and certainly was more popular than Brown's novel. But essentially, there were a couple of different types of novel genres that developed. One was the Gothic, and you see that with um, um, someone like Charles Brockton Brown or something like that, Wieland and, and those kinds of novels. But you also see the, the sentimental seduction novel, which is what we're reading here. So, so that's just a bit of a recap there. Um, going on to some of the themes. These are the important things that I want us to... Uh, to kind of focus on. Let me move myself so that you can see those folks getting married there. Um, themes. Marriage and how to navigate the social expectations. Huge topic of this. Now, before we just have a blast making fun of it, because it is kind of fun to make fun of, uh, this is a fairly serious novel in, in terms of some of its intent anyway. I think Rosen sincerely wants to educate young women of a certain class Okay, not of every class, but of a certain class, that marriage is a serious business. Courtship, dating, um, very serious, with deadly consequences if you don't play the game right. And I think Rosen does think there's a game to it. I don't think that Rosen necessarily likes the fact that there's a game to it, but there's a game uh, to it. Um, and if you don't do it right, if you are a naive, if you're foolish and you don't navigate the social expectations properly, the, the end result is absolute disaster. Um, there is no social safety net. There is no mercy on young women who make poor choices. Um, if you choose the wrong husband, if you choose to live outside of wedlock with someone or have a child outside of wedlock with someone, it is basically the end of your existence as you know it. Now, that is not true. That is not true for a different social class at the time. Working class women, lower class women, um, cohabited with guys, lived with guys, um, married and left guys, or they left them quite frequently. That was not, well, that's not who we're talking about here. The audience for this text is not lower or working class women. It's middle to upper class women who, for whom social constraints were very, very serious. The second um, uh, theme, which is really kind of related to the first, is this theme of prudence. You see it throughout the novel. Is she's always talking about prudence and prudence and imprudence and all of these kinds of things. Well, what is prudence? We'll talk about it in a little bit. But um, it's it's really important to Rosen that, that everyone exhibit, not just young women, but everyone exhibit prudence. And then 
another theme here is the duty and prescribed roles for young women. Uh, the appropriateness or inappropriateness of one's conduct, even as a 15-year-old, is super important. It's not just about the consequences, it's about expectations that people have of you. Um, you are not expected as a young woman of means, a teenager of means, to go on and get a an academic education. You were go you were expected to go on and get finished is a way of speaking at a finishing school. You would learn things like needlework, music, languages, art, uh, domestic arts, um, but you wouldn't learn science and philosophy and history and government or any of that kind of thing. Upper class young women didn't do that, um, certainly not until the 19th century. Now, our next writer is going to usher that in. That's going to be a problem for her. Uh, that's Margaret Fuller. We'll get to her this coming week, and it will be a real eye-opener, but she's going to address that. But, but the role for young women, especially upper-class young women, was not to go and learn a trade, and it was not to learn academic, um, uh, pursue academics. It was to pursue sort of what were called the domestic arts or the finer arts or the refinement arts um, for, for, to, to be a suitable wife and fill a certain role in, in domestic society. It was a fairly uncommon thing for a woman, and she had to be a fairly assertive person and a fairly independent person like Abigail Adams or someone like that to go out and teach her things, teach herself things, I should say, to read widely, to read serious uh, works of, um, of, of nonfiction, of scientific reasoning, uh, scientific works, um, it's fairly, fairly uncommon. Um, so it wouldn't be uncommon at all for the wife of a very highly placed, wealthy merchant who is high society, a wife who really wasn't terribly well read or terribly literate, but did know how to make doilies and dance and play the harpsichord and maybe knew a little smattering of Italian. Not terribly useful. We'll get to that when we get to Margaret Fuller, though. So, what does the novel really have to say about marriage? Well, it's got a lot of things to say about it. And it, at first, you know, the, the sort of the sexual theme of it kind of overshadows everything else. But if you dig a little deeper, I think Rosen is trying to make some important points. Is she um, kind of laying it on thick with the, I'm telling a moral lesson here and I'm not, you know, exploiting... Um, the the um, the sexiness of the story, I, I I I you decide. I do think she does have some serious motives here. What message, for example, is Rosen sending girls about marriage? How can this be seen as an advice book? It is kind of an advice book. Now, advice books were a genre that were put out and have been put out for a number of years, uh, for, for for a number of decades and, and centuries even. And the the kind of advice book you would get uh, to to young people who are about to get married, uh, advice books to young men, um, um, Poor Richard's Almanac, and uh, 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 Franklin's autobiography are both advice books of a sort to young men getting started in business. So this follows along in those footsteps in some ways, though it's fiction. You've got a clash here that she's that she's you know painting a picture of a, cl a religious clash, religious views, economic views, biological views. Right? There's biology involved in this. We're all attracted to somebody, I guess, maybe not, you know, in, in, not necessarily in an overtly sexual way, but we're all, we're all attracted to other people, one would think. Um, and a, a quite, you know, clash on views about what constitutes contentment in life and happiness in life, right? So you saw Mr. Temple's father who had this horrible view of marriage. It was just, you know, go marry somebody who's got a lot of money. And Montreville's father has the same view. Uh, don't you marry a poor girl. I, I'll cut you off, boy. Um, you know, you're not going to waste the family fortune on some girl who's uh, not got anything. Um, and then we see this wonderful passage. It's a sad passage, but it's one where the narrator, and we're going to talk about the narrator in just a second. The narrator is in those, those many, many sections in the novel where she addresses the reader directly in an attempt to gain sympathy from the reader, because there is this clash that goes on in the novel. If Charlotte doesn't do exactly the, the right sorts of things to meet our expectations, then we lose sympathy for her if we're an 18th century teenager 
who's an upright moral girl who doesn't do bad stuff, okay? I'm sure there were like a couple of bad girls who were like, yeah, go Charlotte. However, most of them probably weren't. And so there, the, Rosen runs the risk, as we said in class, of potentially losing the sympathy of the reader because the, the reader simply says, oh, that's just, that's, that's wicked and she shouldn't behave that way. And, and also you lose the sympathy of the reader if, if in depicting her fall from the sexual purity, um, it's not depicted exactly the right way, or it's very easy for a, you know, a lot of young teenagers, when we're younger, we do this, are very judgmental, you know, but I wouldn't have done that. That's their, oh, she's just a bad girl. She's just a, right. I mean, it's very easy to do that. So she's got to break down that barrier, try to present Charlotte as being a little bit more sympathetic. And in doing so, she actually raises the risk level for this, for the, if, if you look at this character, Charlotte and say, well, I'm glad I'm not like that. I'd never do that. Right. But Rosen's got to kind of wheedle away at that and say, number one, you don't know whether you would or not. And if you did, you'd want sympathy, too. So she's got to work on the reader a bit. And on page 102 of my text, anyway, I don't know what it is of your text. Uh, this is in chapter 18. Um, we read this. And this is a great passage in a way. She says, the wife whose breast glows with affection to her husband and who in return meets only indifference can but faintly conceive her anguish. Now, she's trying to say the worst thing you can be is a mistress. Even if you're in a loveless marriage, even if you're in a loveless marriage, right? It's better than what Charlotte has become. The wife whose breast glows with, uh, with affection for her husband. If you love your husband and he doesn't care about you, um, you don't know, you, that's still not as bad. Um, dreadfully painful is the situation of such a woman, but she has many comforts of which our poor Charlotte has been deprived. The duteous, faithful wife, though treated with indifference, has one solid pleasure within her own bosom. She can reflect that she has not deserved neglect, right? So you got one thing going for you if you're a neglected wife whose husband is no longer in love with you. At least you know, I don't deserve it. I'm not at fault here, okay? I didn't do anything wrong. Can't say that about Charlotte. Okay, she made bad mistakes. Um, she can uh, um, that she was never that she has ever fulfilled the duties of her station with her strict exactness, and she she may hope by constant assiduity and unremitted attention to recall her wanderer and be doubly happy in his returning affection. So she can hope that he loves her again. Although why would you want to? But whatever. Um, she's got her. She's got something Charlotte doesn't have. She knows she has done her duty. She knows she has done nothing wrong. She knows she's not at fault here. Her husband is. And she can always hope and pray that her husband will come back to her or what have you. She knows she cannot leave her. He cannot leave her to unite himself to another. Ah, there's an interesting point. Listen, she, he may not love her, but he can't leave her because divorce was a non, non-existent thing back then. You just couldn't do it. So she's like, mm, at least he can't leave me. He's got to support me. The law says so. He cannot cast her out to poverty and contempt. She looks around her and sees the smile of friendly welcome um, or, or the tear of affectionate consolation in the face of every person whom she favors with her esteem. And from all these circumstances, she gathers comfort. People, I mean, it may be pity, but it, at least people care about you, right? Your husband can't throw you out. He can't divorce you and leave with some, for somebody else. He can't cut you off. You've done your duty. At least you have what? Your dignity and your respect. You have social respect. People may feel sorry for you because they know what kind of jerk you're married to, but they, they feel respect for you. But the poor girl, but the poor girl who by thoughtless passion is led astray, Charlotte, who in parting with her honor has forfeited the esteem of the very man to whom she has sacrificed everything dear, she feels herself a poor solitary being in the midst of surrounding multitudes. Shame bows her head to the earth. Remorse tears her uh, distracted mind, and guilt, poverty, and disease close the dreadful scene. She sinks unnoticed to oblivion. This is a very serious warning. Now, we've been joking around a little bit about Rosen kind of throwing out little sprinkling little uh, racy things and, and naughty things out there. But Rosen's deadly serious. If you do what Charlotte did, you could end up completely cut off. Everything will be taken from you. You could die a fairly desperate death. And in fact, women who took up being a man's mistress once he dumped them, there wasn't a lot for them to do. Remember, they weren't very well educated. They weren't trained for a job. If you were from that class, what would become of you? I can tell you what would come, become of you. You would become somebody else's mistress and then somebody else's mistress. And before you know it, maybe you're out on the street. And that's why she's hinting about disease. 
Okay. That's what she's hinting at is that you're going to become a prostitute if you don't watch out. And so this is deadly serious for her. And she's really trying to emphasize that I keep moving myself around, don't I? Um, so what we get into is three principal concepts that undergird the themes of the text. One, prudence, which deals with judgment. You've got to have good judgment. Benevolence, which means good actions towards others. You notice all the instances of good action, kindliness, generosity. None of those are ever criticized. A person's prudence, a person could act prudently or imprudently, you should act prudently. A person could be cold or a person could be benevolent, you should act benevolently. Okay? Sentiment then is feeling. And, and although this is a novel in the sentimental seduction tradition, it's not a novel that says sentiment by itself is good. Okay, so that's an interesting thing. You know, a lot of these novels were just, you know, they're all weepy, weepy and crybaby stuff and all this kind of stuff. But th this novel's got a lot of that in it. She even addresses the reader at one point. I wonder if that's where 139, where I'm getting at there. Let me get to it real quick for you. Um, oh, yes. Uh, in 139, she even knows she's well, quite self-aware of, uh, of what she's doing here. Um, she's writing in a particular tradition. It's sentimental. It's designed to make you cry for poor Charlotte at the end, right? And and you and I might not cry. You might say, oh, come on, hurry up and die, kid. Um, but a 15-year-old reading this back in the 1790s would have been moved to tears about what happened to poor Charlotte. It's such a shame. Oh, goodness. Probably would have cried her eyes out, okay? Um, and and she, it roasts very well. Um, uh, aware of the fact that she's writing in that tradition and that people are quite critical of that tradition and that some readers are a little, are a little bit tougher skinned than others. Okay. And so she even addresses the reader here at the beginning of chapter XXVIII. I guess that's 28. Um, Bless her heart, cries my young, volatile reader. I shall never have patience to get through these volumes. There are so many ahs and ohs, so many, so much fainting and tears and distress. I am sick to death of the subject. Rosen knows that some of her readers will say this. Oh, gosh, how weepy are we going to get? I'm so tired of all this crying and blubbering and blabbing and all this kind of stuff. Come on, get on with it. Um, my dear, cheerful, innocent girl. She's talking to her reader here. For innocent, I will suppose you to be or you would acutely feel the woes of Charlotte. Did conscience say thus might it have been with me had not providence interposed to snatch me from destruction? Therefore, my lively, innocent girl, I must request your patience. I am writing a tale of truth. I mean to write it to the heart, that if perchance the heart is rendered impenetrable by unbounded prosperity, little rich kid, Think you're not going to ever have anything bad happen to you. Think I'm better than everybody else. Only bad girls and poor girls have this happen to them. Uh -huh. Snotty-nosed little brat. Or a continuance in vice. I expect not my tale to please. Nay, I even expect it to be thrown by with disgust. But softly, gentle, fair one, I pray you throw it not aside till you have perused the whole. Mayhap you may find something herein to repay you for the trouble. Methinks I see a sarcastic smile sit on your countenance. And what, cry you, does the conceited author suppose we can glean from these pages if Charlotte is held up as an object of terror to prevent us from falling into guilty errors? Does not LaRue triumph in her shame, and by adding art to guilt, obtain the affection of a worthy man and rise to a station where she... So in other words, some readers might say, well, LaRue did what she had to do, man. She got old Creighton. Creighton's kind of a doffer. She's got him. She's leading around by the nose, got all his money and everything. What then is the moral you would inculcate? In other words, she is anticipating the arguments of readers who would who would either scoff at her or say, this is too, too mushy or, you know, oh, thanks, old lady, for giving me advice, but I know what I'm doing. You don't know what you don't know. You know, some spoiled rich kid. So she really she really dives into it and she gives a good point on 62, 63, don't have time to get to every one of these uh, passages, but she gets to, uh, she, she gives a good de um, uh, kind of explanation of how sentiment or feeling can be exploited. So what she's saying is there is a proper use of sentiment. I'm trying to connect you to someone whose life experience, it's fictional, but it's based on true story, whose life experience is very different from yours, whose whose choices may be very different from yours, and I'm trying to get you to feel something for them. So sentiment can be something that's exploited. It can also be something that is useful in prompting you to be prudent and be benevolent. 
Okay, so this is really important. Benevolence has the proper result of being moved by sentiment. But sentiment alone can get you to do stupid stuff, right? If you're just all, you know, all emotion and not any, and you're not prudent about what to do, then you'll rush out and do something for someone and it may not be the smart thing to do for them. You see, prudence must govern our sentiments is what she's arguing, I think, in the text. Her attachment to Montreville is the ultimate imprudent act. You shouldn't have done it. He's fickle and he's very, very immature. He goes from hot, from hot to cold. He falls in love with this other hot girl. Um, there's a whole philosophy being offered here is what I'm saying. It's more sophisticated than you think. And I, I kind of fear that in class we were having fun with it so much that we didn't realize that, yeah, I think Rosen is on a certain level kind of manipulating the reader because it's pretty easy to man manipulate a teenage girl um, into feeling one way or thinking another way or, or what have you. And, and yeah, she's using kind of some manipulative tactics. But at heart, I think she does have something serious that she's trying to say to them. And that is, kid, the stakes for you, if you're a, a, a young girl of, of means, property, wealth, the stakes for you are really high. And you are so young and so naive and so innocent. If I have to scare you out of doing stupid stuff, I'll do it, right? So so she also focuses again on the duty and roles of young women. Beauchamp wants to reunite Charlotte Temple with her parents. Beauchamp is kind of set up as sort of the ideal goody two-shoes girl. To us, we're like, eh, she's too happy. She's too content. Oh, I have my 87 children and I'm knitting all day and my husband makes great money and we sit around and, and we engage in prayer and Bible study all the time and nothing bad happens to us, etc. It's a little idealized. Um, but guess what? If Beauchamp's life is boring, it's better than poverty and death and disease. Is that what Rosen's offering us? Look, you may not like a boring lifestyle. You may not like the idea of marrying a minister or a, or, or a business person and living a boring life and, and reproducing and having umpteen children, but it's better than the alternative. I mean, most of us would say it's kind of sad and unfulfilling to have just those two alternatives, but Rosen is deadly serious. I, she is deadly serious. Um, but it's too late for, for Beauchamp to reunite CT with her parents. I call her CT. Um, aren't the temples themselves at fault as well? We talked a little bit about that. They, they have great sentiment. Do they have the prudence that they need? Right? Don't know. You decide. Another thing that comes up in here that I think is worthy of your consideration, very much so, is this one passage that I think is one of the most sort of devastating passages that there is. It's on page 118 of my text. Um, and uh, I'll give you the chapter number here. I believe it's chapter 22. Yes, it's chapter 22, where she's, again, um, this is Charlotte writing to her mother. And Charlotte says, I scorned to claim from his humanity what I could not obtain from his love. In other words, I, I, try, I tried to get him to feel some sympathy and pity for me and get that from him, even though I couldn't get his love talking about Montreville here. I, I couldn't I couldn't fully win his love. I, I appealed to his humanity and he didn't seem to have any. I was conscious of having forfeited the only gem that could render me respectable in the eyes of the world. I'm going to read that again. She forfeited the only gem that could render me respectable in the eyes of the world. What is that gem? What's her virginity? Now, Wow, uh, yeah. this is this raises some serious, serious ethical questions and moral questions. Young girls at that time, at that social class and you know economic class, it was just never considered appropriate for them to engage in sexual relations prior to marriage or with anybody other than their husband. I mean, it was just it was just unheard of. It was just not something respectable women did. And if you did it, it was just, again, the consequences were just devastating. And, and, and that we probably all recognize. But for her to phrase it this way, the only gem that could render me respectable. So it is not your intellect. It is not your character. It is not your integrity. It is not your heart. It is not your consciousness. It's not your soul. It's not your spirit that renders you respectable. It's your virginity. Now, I think Rosen chose to say that and have her character say that for a reason. 
I'm not sure Rosen thinks that that should be true, but I think she thinks it is true. That, unfortunately, if you're a girl like Charlotte from where Charlotte's from, it's the one thing that separates you from a completely different class of human beings that you don't really want to be part of. You don't ever want to fall to that. To put such an emphasis on one's virginity, it's been called, of course, the cult of virginity um, in the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, but it's just, it's, it's huge. Um, uh, it's hugely important. Well, the peculiarly direct statements to the reader, are they awkward, annoying, odd? Um, worse yet, to the reader's moms. Um, now listen here, mom. Don't be throwing this out as trash, right? This direct re reference to, to my direct addressing to the readers and the mom. Why did she feel compelled to do this? It's a rather defensive tactic, don't you think? I think it's a rather defensive tactic. It, it, it certainly shows that she was quite aware that people would object to this. Even people reading it who bought the novel would object to a lot of what was in it. Um, it's almost as though she's having a debate with the reader, a debate with the reader's mom. Um, now, with all art, you should also ask, what did the artist have to gain by doing X or Y or Z? How did doing X or Y or Z help achieve some goal or objective? It's doubtful Rosen just directly addressed the readers or their mothers for fun. She's doing it as a tactic, a tactic for what purpose? What's the reasoning behind doing so? The book purports to be didactic, and we can certainly see this in its focus on the young readers, but is it not also taking aim at parents? I know we said that the parents come off as the bullies and the meanies and the baddies, but you know, I think there probably is a message here for some of the parents or moms, especially. You know, be careful what you push your kid into. Be careful that you're not imprudent in raising your child. Be careful that you cultivate sentiment, but not without judgment, right? Um, for all that, I think that the key question still remains for us, what are we to make of the book? Is it progressive? That's an interesting question. Is this book a progressive book because it talks about things that weren't supposed to be talked about? That it exposes girls to the real gritty truth about what happens to you if you don't do the right thing? Uh, is it empowering in that sense? Or does it seek to enforce conformity? You better behave, right? So you could look at this book and you could say, no, 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 no. It's talking about things that weren't supposed to be talked about. It's the only opportunity that young girls had to learn about these kinds of things, right? Because it was just not talked about in proper circles. What happens to you if you run away with a man? What happens to you if you get pregnant before getting married? What happens to you? Whatever. And these were just such taboo and forbidden subjects. In some sense, raising them, even if there was a little bit of a prurient interest in trying to drum up sales, is still considered, I would think, by many, a fairly progressive thing to do because it's giving girls information, albeit fictional, that they would never have had. They're so sheltered. And it also engages in a very frank conversation about consequences. And one wonders whether their parents really were giving them frank conversations about consequences or whether they were just simply saying, here are the rules, don't ask me why you have to follow them, and don't ask me what horrible things will happen if you don't. Um, and Rosen at least seems to be advocating that girls need to know the truth, even if it's gussied up with a lot of tears and a lot of fiction. And um, maybe she feels like that's the only way to get through to a 15-year-old in the 1790s. But some people might look at it and say, she's still enforcing conformity and traditionally restrictive gender roles. She's still telling girls not to color outside the lines, don't be different. But even if she's doing that, is she doing them a favor? I mean, what if we have a Rosen here who is saying, I'm just telling you the truth and someone needs to tell you the truth. The truth may or may not be fair, but I'm telling you now that if you don't watch out, you're going to be in big trouble and you're going to ruin your life and your parents' life if you don't watch out. She may have thought the world shouldn't be like this, but she may also have thought, while it is, I better tell these girls what, the, what reality is and you better watch out what you do. Um, is it illuminating? Or is it repressive? I think you have to decide that. I don't, I don't know. In some ways, I can see both sides of that and say, it makes me cringe that she would, be, that she would advocate this. Why is she not more forward-looking?
uh, in other ways, I sometimes fall back and say, well, I'm not sure she could have been. I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. You'll have to decide for yourself. Our next writer, though, is going to be quite forward-looking, so forward-looking she's going to be ostracized a bit, and that's Margaret Fuller, but we'll get to her next week. In the meantime, um, I'd like for you to do your quiz and send it in to me by email, as we always will do. Send it to my Yahoo account, please. No later than Tuesday at midnight, if you would. Two questions. What trick does Belcor pull to try to get Charlotte for himself? He he um, pulls a trick to try to get her for himself. And number two, what eventually becomes of Belcor? What happens to him specifically? Um, post your thoughts also to the class discussion board on our discussion topic, which I'll have posted. Please do that no later than Tuesday at midnight as well. For discussion posts, please don't just go through the motions. I'll have a prompt there. I'm just looking for you to post your opinion. You don't have to come back and 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 comment on other people's opinions because honestly a, a lot of people well i won't say that um many people post oh what a great comment that was when they're just trying to look like they're being active on the board no that's okay um i want you to read other people's comments and other people's takes on things on this question because i think it's really interesting to hear other people's thoughts but you don't have to respond to everybody all the time you can if you want to everybody's welcome to do that but i don't have an expectation that you're going to be in there going oh well way to go good 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 question good answer good good comment right put forward your ideas intelligently but Benefit from reading those of others. I think that's good. And if you feel like somebody's made a good point, or if you disagree, then uh, post something in there. Always, 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 right? We're all human beings. We're all God's kids. Um, let's be civil, and, and I know you will be, okay? All right, we will see you on cl in class on Thursday.